as it happens, we don't have the space to facilitate, but we have a youth club in five minutes a week at the minute. The education authority are trying to close the youth club, but we're facing that there. Hopefully, we'll have a good news story over the next couple of weeks in regard to that. So, anyway, it was great to be able to have RT Canada to fall back on. RT Canada is a wonderful hub for organising these types of events. Gordon Moon has a big interest in creating spaces for for reflection, for history, for politics, and RT Canada has took that mantle up and did a fantastic programme of events over the last period of months. So, this evening, I want to hand you over to Cahillac and the Hen Act. To Rosie McCorley, in short, one of Bill Bustle or, or to Rosie. <laughs> so I'm going to hand you over to Rosie McCorley. Rosie McCorley is, is, is a friend, obviously, of Lawrence and of Jazz's. She's also a Gale Gore, she's also a Republican Irish prisoner, she also works in the Upper Spring Field area. So for us, it was a pleasure uh, that, that Rosie had accepted her invitation to facilitate the conversation here this evening. So, if you can with you, we're going to see Rosie McCauley. Go away, Rosie. Okay, well, Gormaga, the last one, I'm to share with this Gormaga Fossa, Asin Privilege, of A. Partrick, so no people special to show. So, Falcha, Gakdenya, August, go special to Falcha, Hig Lorne, August Jazz, um, both here tonight to talk about uh, the books they've written, which cover um, the period of time they spent in the H blocks of Long Cash and particularly the protest years. So, the many of us are household names, but uh, for some people, maybe you don't know as much about them. So, just by way of a wee bit of background information, Lawrence McKeown. Former Republican prisoner, and he went to prison in 1976, uh, got a life sentence and was released in 1992. During that time, he spent five years on the blanket in the Wash protest and went on to spend 70 days on hunger strike. Uh, Lawrence spent many years also working for Cushion and Air Kimmy, and he was involved um, during that time with the, um, the development of the Long Cash site project. He was also involved um, with myself at the time with uh, dialogue around nation building with uh, all sectors of Irish society and beyond. Since his release, Lawrence has written extensively about his prison experience um, in a doctoral thesis which he completed at Queen's Belfast. Also a feature film, a play, poetry and numerous articles and book chapters. His recent memoir, Time Shadows, covers the first five years of his imprisonment detailing his experience in the blanket protest and hunger strike and this book was published in December 21 by Beyond the Pale Books. Jazz McCann. I, could I follow that? Is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jazz. You didn't show me up. That's it. Former Republican prisoner again arrested also in 1976. Uh, Jazz was sentenced to 25 years and was released in January 1994. He was on the blanket on the no-wash protest, and he actually, I only discovered this after reading the book, he joined the 1980 hunger strike a few days before it ended on the 18th of the 12th, 1980. He was involved in 1983, escape from Long Cash, and for that he was sentenced to another five years. Shortly after his release, he went to Galway University. He qualified as a teacher and went on to teach in Presentation Secondary School of Galway, St Aidan's Primary School of Belfast, and he's now Vice Principal in St Joseph's uh, primary school in Slate Street down the road there. He completed a Master's in Education at Queen's. He's a member of St. Teresa's GIC, playing hurling and football, or maybe previously playing hur hurling and football. They won't let me play anymore. <laughs> right? I still bring my boots, but they won't. They won't. <laughs> Give you <me> place. <laughs> He's also a member of the Kieran Doherty TD Cycle Club, and I know we have an annual cycle to... Um, Bally Connell. Bally Connell, yeah, I can never remember that name. That's for, there's Kieran Doherty money yeah. up there. Yeah. Jazz is married with three children, one grandchild, and he's a champion activist. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into the subject that we're going to talk about. So, Lorne's book, which you all know about, is called Time Shadows. Jazz's is called Six Thousand Days. And both books give very, very detailed accounts of the time spent in prison. So, I'll turn to Jazz first. This is your first book, and uh, given the time that has elapsed since you, since you were in prison... Can I just ask you, what prompted you to write the book at this time? I had a story to tell, I suppose. I suppose everybody's got a story to tell. Um, I felt I had to write it. Um, one of the, one, one, there was a number of factors. Joe MacDonald most definitely was one of them. Um, when we 
people think of the hunger strike, it's mainly body. And so therefore, I wanted people to get an idea of the giant that Joe MacDonald was. Um, so hopefully that comes across in the book. I also felt strongly about Sean McKenna. Um, I don't think history has been kind enough to Sean McKenna. I would regard Sean McKenna as the 11th hunger striker. I know we also say Pat McGill, but I would regard Sean as the 11th hunger striker. Why? Sean was on the first hunger strike, and he fought hard to get on the first hunger strike. He was refused permission to go on the first hunger strike because they believed that he had been shot. And what they wanted was to make sure that everyone was physically fit because the idea of a hunger strike is to build momentum as it goes along. And they felt then if anybody you know, wasn't physically fit then, they would die too soon, basically 30, 40 days or whatever, without the momentum properly building. But he wasn't shot. Um, what happened whenever he was a child, there was boiling and water poured over him and their first skin uh, was um, damaged. And, and that was said, he was, uh, he was physically fit. So after a, a real fight with the dark, the dark was in charge at the time, they agreed to let him go on the hunger strike. And as you probably know the story, as we moved uh, the 18th of December, he was on death's door and the dark took the decision to take him off it because there was a sort of an agreement, a verbal agreement from what I know. And probably the dark says, well, why should he die whenever there's something there we could work on? But the point is, Sean McKenna was prepared to die. And really, Sean McKenna did die. Sean McKenna was rushed to the RVH where he was brought back again. They used a defibrillator on him. And obviously they couldn't keep Sean in the Royal Victoria Hospital because of his profile. They moved him straight away to Musgrave Park, which is probably known as a military hospital. And when they wheeled him in, there was another um, hunger, not, sorry, another ex-blanket man uh, in, in Musgrave as well. That was Dutch Holland. And the doctor came in to Dutch and said, Dutch, would you please go out and tell this fellow Sean McKenna to come off the hunger strike? He doesn't believe me that the hunger strike is over and he's refusing all treatment. So Sean McKenna most definitely was prepared to die in the hunger strike, most definitely. Also, as you probably know as well, Sean McKenna um, took his own life on the anniversary of the hunger strike because Sean McKenna could no, no longer live with himself because of it. Wrongly, he felt guilty about the 10 lads losing their life and it tortured him. And I can tell you now, a couple of times he went to the dark, he got up in the car deal and said to the dark, why did you not let me die? He came on the Falls Road in the leaf bar looking in the dark and he said the same thing, why did you not let me die? So his life was never the same after that and therefore I wanted to mention him to make that clear to everybody that Sean McKenna was prepared to die and he really did die and that was the situation. So, I wanted to get that across. And I also just wanted to tell about life in, in the H-blocks because it's important, I think, that everybody knows exactly what, what went on there. And hopefully it came across as well that we did absolutely everything that was possible for a prisoner to do to avoid hunger strike. Hunger strike was always looming there in the background. Obviously, it was tradition, and of course, that's how they got political status in 72, was the hunger strike with Billy McKee and Crumlin, no jail. We did absolutely everything possible to avoid hunger strike because we had a good idea somebody would die. And that's why we endured those horrible conditions, all the deprivations, the torture, and everything else, so as nobody would die. And that was the idea. So it was a long, hard struggle before the hunger strike, and I said we did everything to avoid that. And again, I hope that comes across as well. Plus, as I said, the story was there, and it was actually approached <coughs> by Keir McGee. I don't know if anybody knows Keir McGee. He also writes. He's a number of plays, and he has a number of books. And he said to me one day, I want to write your story because you were in the H blocks basically from it opened to near enough when it closed. Near enough. It's a couple of years after that. And you were there for the whole protest area, you were there for the escape, and what happened after the escape, and then Crumlin Road Jail, and so on, all the rest. And foolishly, I said, okay, because we had a few drinks. I never thought he would chase after me, which he did. He chased after me the next day, he's down with his laptop in the house, saying, right, let's get started. And away he went. 
And um, so I started telling him the story. And he was, he was, it was about 50,000 words. And he got deeper and deeper. Now, you know what? 50,000 words, we didn't even get to the jail. We're still outside. <laughs> and my wife, my, I know, I know. <laughs> my, wife, my wife said to me, why do you not write yourself? And I did feel that I wrote myself. When I was reading, I said, it just doesn't come across as me. You know, um, he's building me up much bigger than what I actually am. And I wanted to be authentic, and I wasn't coming across as authentic. And I picked up the courage, went up to him, and says, no, um, I'm going to rent it myself. That's okay. I said, see the 50,000 words? You can keep them. You can do whatever you want with them, make fiction out of it or whatever. I just do it from the day and hour I went into jail, which I did. I did it from the day and hour I went into jail, and that was it. So that's some of the reasons why I wrote the book. Okay. okay? So I went on a bit. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go back and forth between different things. So, Lawrence, I just wanted to ask you, and nothing's in any particular order, but we all know about the brutality um, and reading the books. It's horrific. I found it horrific reading what happened to people. And, uh, you, you know, you've both read about it in great detail. What would you say your worst um, memory is? Either something that happened to yourself or something that you witnessed happen to somebody else? <coughs> um... Well, first of all, just at Gormaga Rosie, I was Fergal, Glorna Mona, Shana, Gal Danavo, Bunchoka, Lesh, and Okadjo. Um, I mean, it's, throughout all, I think I probably got off later in some of your minds on what happened in, in, in H3 and write about it. The four swashes, uh, yeah, well, went through the marriage searches and the beatings and the, um, it was particularly when they set up the, the sort of romper room search box down at the visits, which was specifically for. For Blank, I mean, um, it was always the, the waiting for it was always the worst. I mean, you talk about big, bad beatings, but so in some sense, I think it always ended up that the beating that you got wasn't as bad as what you imagined it before. I think I think I learned throughout that whole time that it's, it, it, you know, you're waiting on it happening. And I think the screws caught on that later on because it came the wing shifts to do all the rattling girls. Oh, okay, okay, you're all ready there. Everybody's psyched up. And then it doesn't happen. And then you know, ten minutes later, the same thing happened again. And I remember uh, he writes about it, and I remember making sure my time. Kieran McGillicuddy caught it, saying like it was bells open about seven times one morning. You know, constantly. But it's two hours later before they actually moved. And so I think they started to learn about the <coughs> psychology. But I think the um, I mean, I read a book in the book, but I wasn't in, in H three at that time. It was it was later um, when they started the four swashings, and really. Um, I think the thing that's always interesting to remember about the blocks, you had three, four, and five mainly. For a while, you had six. And it's often Shane and all were moved up to it, and then during the hunger strikes, it was used as well. But three, four, and five, and the PO principal officer in charge of both three and five were Catholics. Um, Kevin Lappin from Tyrone, and Polly Joe Kerr from, from Armagh. I think it was always sort of interesting that that's that background's in it. And Kevin Lappin uh, was very different. I mean, he was on a block, there was no beatings. I actually met him when I was, when I was writing my book. Uh, Grub was given out to prisoners, all the rest of it. Obviously, when he, when he wasn't about, as Jazz could tell you, you know, they got, the, they got the thumping as well. Um, but he had a certain line, and he was hated for it. Screws hated him, called him fucking Provy and Lappin. Whereas in H3, you had uh, Polly Joe Carey, who was just, I mean, he literally was a sadist. I already executed him later years. Because he was still continuing on doing what he was, what he had been doing. But if you think of the way they did it, and it's great in the book, and this is from listening to people and from from uh, nor making this my time, where they brought in the rule, and it's a really interesting thing. And I, I put in the book, I was able to get this confidential document. And it's a classic too about how bureaucracies operate, and the people talk about the the Nazis, and I'm not comparing it with that, but the thing of documenting everything and and putting it across to like a medical thing. And what you have in, the, in that there is. It's a Northern Ireland office of prison authorities writing to the prison governor and saying, so we're advised by the chief medical officer that we need to wash the prisoners for health reasons. Uh, now, we know this is going to cause a lot of conflict, but the chief medical officer, and, and he keeps going back, the chief medical officer has said, so it means on writing, the doctors told us we need to wash these prisoners for their own health. There's going to be whatever outcome. Um, we know they're going to resist, but we have to do it for medical reasons. Well, it's nothing to do with it, because they, they said, but 
nets in the air and head, head lace. There was no head lace. Never was. The whole time, too cold for the head too lace. Cold, to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but in heat three, what you got was six people taking the Tom Boy Loudon and Topak Bradley and uh, Martin Horson ended up then hunger strike three hours, <coughs> and uh, Joe McNaught in it, and they took him in, into a separate wing that was empty, and then. They were sitting for it. They didn't know what was happening. This was a breaking from routine. And then they, um, they took them out and they just battered 11 days out of them and, and washed them and just shaved off their hair and all the rest of it. And um, later that morning, Paddy Joe Kerr called out, Joe, uh, Joe Barnes, <coughs> who was the OC in the block. They never called him out before for any. He wouldn't recognize the OCs. And he says to them, I've got orders to wash everybody in this block. And then to incarnate that order. And what you've seen this morning is really breathing for what will happen if any of your people so much as breathe <coughs> one of my officers. So that was very calculated, cool clinical. Where Mc Martin Horson ended up with um, two toes sprained. Joe McNulty was taken to the outside hospital with a broken nose. Tom by none of the rest were battered. Yeah. So you're talking about a very deliberate thing of saying you know, to, to strike terror. Um, Another thing was the worst in there. Heat four was really bad. I mean, heat. We moved a heap of us at the start of um, some of the Going to read from a letter up to heat six, which we thought was going to be like a. Till he said us to, to sort of focus on us. I mean, it was the dark and Bobby Sands and all this. Just threw the rest of us in to make up the numbers, <laughs> but uh, but it didn't turn out that way. Actually, heat four then became a really like was it the week yeah. the arena <clears> to the shock and Donna, where it was just. I mean, so there's things that happen at times which, um, you know, it's down an individual screw, maybe drunk or something or whatever, it's just a bad day, you know, he's angry about something, you know, has the opportunity, uh, and then other times where it had to be, it had to be directed from the top. So my kids made it, yeah, if I'd had beatings, if everybody had them from that there, uh, but luckily it was in H5, which didn't get the, the force washes, uh, whereas H3 and, and H4 did. And, and all the rest of it was just the normal dragged about and slapped around and all the rest of it. But I think that thing about the, uh, how they entered just the force license and how Paddy Joe Kerr cried it out was just... Yeah. Can I just follow up on sure. that? Yeah. Because it's something I have to mention, you're talking about the worst time, you know. Um, emotionally it was a very difficult period. Um, I mean, the worst would have been obviously after the hunger strikes, 10 lads dead. Um, and we didn't have all what we wanted to show for it. We got it closed, but we were still in protest because um, obviously other things were like no work and so on. And you think like with 10 lads dead, you think, you know, you'd get political status, it'd be quite obvious. So that, that, that was a very difficult period. Um, and it took a, a lot of us, I think, a while to get, to get over that. And what, what was important was we still weren't beat. We're still protesting. And there was people like Shane over at the back, who's very modest, were strategizing, right, what's our next step? And that's the thing, we kept at it and kept at it. So, but it took a while to realize that. Also, between the hunger strikes was very difficult as well, after the first hunger strike, because it promised so much and then it didn't deliver. And the way we were treated was really bad between the hunger strikes as well, because the administration sensed, aha, we're weakness here, you know, they're finished, they played their last card, let's rub it into them. And the way Bobby was treated by Hilditch, um, you know, if you want to come and see me, you put your name down for the governor and you're going to wear that uniform and so on. You know, it was really humiliating and we were telling you, the whole place was going like that there, we were so angry. I can tell you about that later on if you want, about what exactly happened between the hunger strikes and how we tried to accommodate them, because basically I'd say we're saying, get something, get something and poor Bobby was left with it. You know, and they wouldn't give us that, and that was an opportunity to end it, because if they give us a close end, it would have ended. But no, they smelt blood and they went for it. But they didn't realise the strength of feeling that was still there, because there was no way we were ever going to give in. But coming back to the worst, and I know a few lads here know this, and it's well quoted in folklore, the winter of 78 was <laughs> the worst <laughs> period of them all. It really, really, really tested me. Because here's the thing, Yes, a lot of wing shifts were beat up and there was hosing and all those things, but when the rover, the rover, that was it. The winter of 78 just went on and on. You had to face each night and with no windows. And apparently, 
Um, Lisbon at that particular time was the coldest place throughout um, Ireland and the British Isles. It was out right somewhere because we looked this yes. up, then what? Because I knew how cold ridiculous. it was. Yeah. Minus 25. I'll never forget it. I didn't think I could see the morning. And then you know you to do another one, another one. <coughs> really, really testing. Very, very difficult. Very, very difficult time. So for me, most definitely, as far as that goes, the worst time was the winter 78. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, just even re reading about it, like I, I just don't know how how you get through it, how you were able to face each day after day yeah. with just the same miserable, horrible, horrible conditions. And I, and what I was actually wondering was, like, did, did you ever say to yourself, um, looking back, how did I get through that? You know, and like, you, yeah. you know, do you do you actually think? that now or do you remember or was it because you were younger then or what yeah. is it was it off its time well personally i just said there was no option there was no i'm not doing this you were doing it and that was it so whatever the threat you had to stick it you had no choice but there was no there was never any chance of putting that gear on being criminalised, not a chance, no matter what the three others. So that was it. You had no choice, and you never thought of a choice either. I think you had thought there's a you know of a choice that you know you could leave it, you could do this, and so on. I'd say that probably would be mental torture for you, you know, because when you, given what you were going through. But whenever you say I have to do it, and that's it, and it becomes a way of life, you did it, and that was it. Yeah, well, perfect idea for that. Sorry, Laurie. <laughs> <laughs> that's my yeah. opinion. So let me ask you another question here, Lawrence, and it's about, Jazz has referred to it, the period between the ending of the 1980 hunger strike and the commencement of the one in 1981. And I know personally I wouldn't have had much knowledge of what went on. You just knew it was a hazy period <coughs> for, yeah. for people who weren't involved in it. And um, But the, the books fill all those gaps very, very clearly. And Lawrence, you describe this as your worst period of imprisonment. Can you talk us through the details of how events unfolded at the time? Yeah, I was in uh, eight six. Um, they opened in seventy nine for for nine months, and then up was it wasn't used again until the hunger strikes. And probably part of it was prompted by whenever the, the first hunger strike started. There was a lot of people come back from the who had left the protest and go back. Um, and it had been a whole organised thing to do it with uh, John Chillingworth going up the door blocks, purposely setting up to no better man to, <laughs> to round people up to, to encourage people to make this is the big, last big push. As John said, you know, the 1980 hunger strike was meant to end four years of a blanket protest. I mean, people like Kieran Nugent had already done all his time and come back out again, you know, it was out a year by then. Um, so the numbers increased, so they opened, they opened page six again for, for one of the wings. And like Jazz, I was one of the ones who joined it. Um, and the 30 of us were put on the hunger strike after 50 days, uh, more as a publicity thing. I was in the cell with um, Anthony McIntyre, and it was after lockup. And next minute, I heard the keys all going and footsteps down the wing. You never like to hear keys at night after lockup because you know it didn't usually bode well. And the next minute, I heard them at my door, and. Um, Cell door was open and Bobby walked in, Bobby Sands. And he says, uh, it's Fashi Creighton, it's over, Fashi Creighton. And you see, like, he was really uh, stressed. But Bobby was a lot of energy anyway, but like, you, you could see, he was, you can imagine what was going on in his head, he was going around all the blocks. And the let him into my cell by mistake, Pat McEwan was the OC in Heat 6. At the time, he was just straight across from me. And, um, and that was, that was a couple of words, and he just went straight out and over, over the pad. <clears throat> and of course, the whole wing's shouting, like, what's going on? What's going on? I was shouting down there. He said, the Bobby, that was in, he said, the, um, the stock's over. So he was with for about 10, 10 minutes and then left. And Pat got up to say, yes, he had been called, that Bobby had been called up to the hospital. Um, there had been this document um, presented earlier to the hunger strikers. Um, he was going to have a meeting the next morning with all the, the OCs in, in H3, which he did. Pat and all went. Um, the next morning, door opened in this civil servant in these forms to tell us like what was an <coughs> offer. You know, once we conform to, and I mean, they want to say shove it. I mean, that's what do you mean? What do you mean conform to here? You know, uh, like we know there's something going on. But that 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 set in a, a doubt in the back of the mind. What's 
what's happening here. Then Pat was taken out over to see Bobby, and so you always go, yeah, we know that the Brits will manoeuvre things, and they're not going to say up front or on the news that, yeah, yeah, we've, we've given it. Because the news is saying, hunger strike was called off, no, no concession from me. So you've got this going on, but at the same time, you have know, Bobby Felt running about the block. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I heard about afterwards was that Hilditch, he was the number one governor, um, like born again, fundamentalist. I mean, his next in line, Albert Miles, had been shot yeah. dead by the IRA. So a real person, he was on holiday. He cut short his holiday, came back to personally oversee the whole thing. And once he arrived, that was... That was the end of, of Bowie getting around the, yeah. around the camp and all the rest. It was total capitulation or, or, or nothing. Um, but there's this confusion going on in, in, in the meantime because Bobby did get run about for a few days. So part of me coming back from the meeting was saying, so what's, what's happening? Because we're still putting shit in the walls. So like, what's, what's going down here? The news is saying we get nothing. Um, there's still this bit of movement. So what exactly is it? And that, I describe it as that worse thing because it was like, what exactly is happening here? Like before that, you knew the crack. <laughs> the morning the screws were going to come in, you make it a wing, you make it a batter, and you make it touch for some cigarettes that day or whatever else. So it's clear was now there's this hunger strike which was meant to end four years of this year. Um, and then you start to get, you know, different ones in the wing, but of dissent, and like, what exactly is happening? And, and what do you mean, and like, and fair bit, Pat McKeown was put under, like, all sorts of pressure. Like, well, hold on, Pat, how, how is that the case if, you know, we're still exactly where we were. And then you had the victory march up the Falls Road, and um, you know, and, and some people run a high, as yes, somehow in a couple of days it's all going to sort of, we're going to move straight from yeah. no wash protest until the cages, you know. Um, and it was somewhere around there, and I started thinking that this is not, this is not looking well, and that's what I describe it, that worth of, of just uncertainty. It says that we might just pack this in, after that length of time, I think it's jazz is saying that. And it's not a big gung ho macho thing about, yeah, I want to get, you know, carry on with this or whatever, but it's like everything has been invested in this. Like yeah. all the, you know, the one or the 78, the beatings, all the rest of it. And then when Bobby tried, I think the two wings would go off and jazz was on the wings, he can talk about it, to see if there was any, you know, they'd agree to wash, uh, clean out their cells, get moved to clean accommodation. And ten people would would agree to be um, orderlies or to do work that wasn't you know, like sort of educational work and all the rest of it, just to test out the system to see what it was. And of course, it all you know they give they give nothing, and and that was us uh, on, on the hunger strike. I mean, I think Bobby, um, and I mean I do right. I don't. It's not, it's not like there's anything new revealed in, in in my book, but I think it's a matter of putting everything together and I say on it I can understand why Brandon Hughes um, called off the hunger strike he had promised um, Sean McKenna that he wouldn't let him die but I don't think he had any right to promise Sean McKenna that Bobby Sands was able to say he could say the hunger strike ends or, or goes ahead um, I think Brandon still thought he was able to say so while, and I talked to him and I interviewed him and I quoted in the book in, in, in years later. And I suppose I wanted to say in the book, to me, Bobby Sands' greatest moment wasn't you know, elected as, a, as an MP or, or then even. It was that night on the 18th of December in the hospital because yeah. he was handed a fucking disaster. Yeah. Basically, yes, there's all the talk about, yeah, just come off and look at this and look at that and here's a document and explore that. When Bobby arrived, you know, the hunger strike was over. And the Brits are sitting and obviously going, oh, well, they've had their hunger strike, they've had their whatever else. Now, they still had the opportunity, anybody with, you know, you know uh, maybe thinking, well, let's, 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 let's give something here and make sure that it's over and all the rest of it. But I mean, like, that's not like the Brits being humanitarian, there's never shown that anywhere in the world. Or you know? even sensible. Or even sensible, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they could have very, very... Well, they could have given us clothes the same as they did at the end of it. And of course. It, probably, it would have caused a lot of dissent amongst a lot of our own ones and all the rest. But it would have... It would have made it... Made, yeah, It would have been a very difficult to yeah. win our, our hunger strike. Yeah. And that's why I say that the Bobby's... And Bobby apparently had a row the dark in, in, in the end. In and I think... And what I say is, 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 is grand this moment, because I think, this is only my view of it, 
that Brendan worked very closely with Bobby. Obviously, Bobby was a PRO throughout the years. Um, I think Brendan made Bobby OC, seen it as it'll be temporary. The hunger strike will happen. We'll win the hunger strike, and Brendan will go back to being the OC again. So it was only a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. And then it all went parachute. And for Bobby to, uh, I mean, what I said, that moment, it was like the, um, and, and it's not to, remember Bobby was made OC, I remember thinking, fuck. Like Bobby's one of the lads, you know, like he's, like the BOC, because before that it was the dark, and he had, for me at that time, and for a lot of people, he had a whole presence about him, um, obviously a very skilled volunteer, big reputation, all the rest, but so it had a, a physical presence about him, you know, whereas Bobby was like, Bobby's one of us, you know, yeah. <laughs> that was the idea, like to be, to be leadership, you had to be, like a big lesson for me, you know, in the later years, that you, know, you had to be this some air about you, which really wasn't the case. Whereas in that moment, it was, it was like the, um, you know, the, the training of the pupil becomes the tutor. Yeah. You know, the, the apprentice becomes the master craftsman in that moment. And that was Bobby's moment. Because he could have just went along with Dart and go, okay, well, let's, yeah. let's see what we can do here, you know. But he didn't, he says, no. Yeah. I mean, he went back to the block and said, there's going to be more hunger strike. And then he, he sort of pulled back a bit on that there and tried to, Probably with outside and all, saying them, like, the last thing when he has no hunger strike. Um, but he probably could see clearly. I said that moment yeah. instinctively. Yeah. And even with the, uh, I mean, it's, it's not a big secret. I mean, other people, individuals in the camp threatened to go on hunger strike at the time. That's right. So we had to deal with yeah. internal yeah. dissent because they were saying, fuck this, we yeah. didn't do four years of this, you know. Yeah. So it was, you're talking about a moment that was, like, whereas before everybody was united against the whole system now it was like what exactly is happening yeah. where are we going and whenever Bobby actually put around the, the comms saying there's going to be more hunger strike and got never everything just level yeah. right, right, this is it this is where we're can I just follow up on a couple of things first you see we're going at Sean McKenna and saying the dark um, dark don't let me die Sean McKenna afterwards was going around asking because I heard it from Raymond and Leo they were on the hunger strike as well seven of them together um, so Leo and Raymond were saying he, he asked us did, did did I say that? You know, did I really say it? Dark don't let me die? Because he's no recollection of it, right? Nor had they, by the way. But I don't know what was said in private. I'm just saying Sean McKenna had no recollection of it. But anyway, um, and just on another one, quick one, you know, we're talking about the worst days and worst days. Can I just say what the best day, and again, I think there'll be an agreement in this, the best day, without a doubt, was the day that Bobby Sands got elected. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. It was because, um, we were pretty sure, unfortunately, that Bobby was going to have to give his life, and he knew that. It was like dead man walking because of what happened in the first hunger strike in particular. You had to prove yourself, and he put himself forward. Never for one minute believed it was going to be 10. So Bobby put himself forward, and we thought, he's going to die. He's going to die. But when he got, when he was elected by the people from Fermanagh from South Tyrone, we thought that was this. This is going to save his life. The place just erupted. Now, we had smuggled radios in. So we were getting the news, and the order came out. They were expecting this result, and we were about 20 past, past, past four, and no one was to say anything. They gave us a keep it quiet, and we'll pass the word up the pipes, and so on, and whispered, because if we start screaming and shouting and cheering, the screws on those radio will come in and rip the place apart. And in our wing, Gino McCormick, you know, uh, Boo Egg, Egg Robarts, we couldn't control, we just erupted the place, just erupted. <laughs> I think you could hear it from Belfast, I didn't care, didn't care anymore. <laughs> El, the radio, he's got it, you know. Because we thought it would save his life, you know. But obviously it didn't. But between the hunger strikes, that Saturday, word was coming in, I think it was the Thursday, was it? Uh, the 18th mm -hmm. of Thursday. And that Saturday, lads were out in visits, and Bobby was out in a visit, and Bobby was saying, it's going to be another hunger strike. So right away, the talk was hunger strike. I'm not in the know, you probably have to ask Shane of this. I think outside said, under no circumstances is there be a hunger strike. They probably lost confidence in us and didn't realise the depth of feeling within the camp. But they basically, I think, said was, listen, get something. Just get something and get it over with. And Bobby was left to run back and forward then to the governor. At the start, it was fine because they're recognising our structures and they're bringing the OCs together up to H3 or they're bringing him around and so on. So we said, that's good. The very fact that they're recognising the structures is good. 
And then another big factor was, it was Christmas Eve, I think it was, um, Father Tony came round and said, listen, we have an agreement here for Christmas. What's going to happen is, you're all going to report for sick, and obviously, given the conditions and so on, that was okay. And if you're sick, then you can just wear pyjamas, so therefore weren't wearing that monkey suit. So, we would get out of the cells, and we would have that period over Christmas where the negotiations would go on and so on. So it was looking good then. We said, good, the negotiations are going on. We're going to come off the protest here um, over the Christmas holidays. Brilliant. And we were the first one to face this because we were told we're going to move into a clean wing. Remember, we're on the, the, the no wash protest at this time. And we give a guarantee that we would not um, dirty or wreck the place. And so the enjoyment wing was all ready for us. And that morning, what they do is they come in, whenever there's a wing shift, there's cards outside your cell with your details, you know, your name, your number, and how many years you're doing, and so on. And they come in and they take the cards out from all around the cells, and they go over and they put them in the other cells in the other, the other wing. So that morning, happy days, the place is up to a million. Yes, we're going to be watching Chitty Chitty Bang Bang here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, the command, they took the, they took the cards, we're all stopping, waiting, all anxious, great Christmas cake and all the rest. And uh, then they the withdrew from the wing, and it was all quiet, and it remained quiet, I'd say, for about an hour. And then they come back in again, and they put the cars back, right? And we realised then, there's no mission of these people moving, because if they can't do that, which was reasonable, if they can't do a Christmas then, they're not interested in any form of compromise whatsoever. But Bobby kept at it, he kept going to the governor, and then, as I said, the resentment was really building within the blocks, the way he was being <coughs> treated, the way he was having to go, cap in hand, basically, the, 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 the governor. We were absolutely ripping it. And then word came in that we were going to, and our way was two wings. There was Bobby's wing in H3 and our wing in H5. We were told we were going to de-escalate the protest in order to, to facilitate them implementing the agreement. Because there was, there was a sort of an agreement there, but basically a nod and a wink, and it was the way interpreted. So we de-escalated, we were moved into the clean cells, furniture cells, um, and there was so many went forward say that were prepared to do educational work, that they were prepared to do maintenance in the wing, which we're always prepared to do anyway. So it was 10 of them. And the idea was then that their crows would come in, and then hopefully we'll be building that. <coughs> they just says, there's no way. If you, you must conform properly, you're going to leave them wings, you're going to report to the governor, you're going to agree to go to work, you're going to put on that suit, and so on and so on, and there's absolutely no chance. Thankfully, the word came that night, once they refused to close, the wreck the place. And I tell you, it was one of the better moments to wreck the place, because you almost felt humiliated during that whole period, and angrily, really full of anger, the way Bobby was being treated, because we knew there was absolutely no way we would be. There was absolutely no way we were given in. We want to keep going until we got our demands. Right? We were absolutely determined about that. So we smashed the place up. Brilliant. It's not so brilliant whenever the rats go up. <laughs> you know, and that was, that was the worst wing shift ever, I have to say. That was the worst wing shift ever. But anyway, you were back at it again, and then it was going to be a hunger strike. It was great. That's it. It's a hunger strike. But the point is, we bent over backwards. They accommodate them. We bent over backwards for them to make some kind of move so as we could say, okay, then let's move in the blocks. Not that we were giving out, uh, giving in, sorry. We we're always going to keep going and going and going. We never stop. And as I said before, no matter what they give us, we wanted more. We, we would always, always travel, but we would never arrive. No matter what it was, we'll move on to the next thing and the next thing. And that's exactly the way it was in jail when the first hunger strike. We weren't going there again. It had to be, yes, this is what's happening. Okay, right, so as you mentioned earlier on at the beginning um, that you know, your reason for writing the book was you wanted to um, talk about Joe MacDonald yeah. and you know I got it from the book, I mean that you had yeah. a very very special bond and I have to say I loved the Christmas cake story. <laughs> loved it. So did I, couldn't believe it a year later. <laughs> yeah. So in the last few paragraphs of, of the book, um, your final thoughts on release from the blocks yeah. turned towards Joe. And it was a very, I thought it was very moving, it yeah. really impacted me. Yeah. So, how, how do you remember him? Well, you see, he made a big, it wasn't just me, he made a big impression. He made a big impression wherever he went. 
Um, he was a giant of a man, um, big personality, <laughs> and someone who you could admire because the way he stood up to the screws as well. And he, in a way, sort of way, protected you. You know, he would look after you. Um, you know, we, we were all young then. We, I would regard you as a man, right? And, and he was a sort of fatherly figure. And he was great crack. He, I don't know, the story, I don't know, so half of them probably weren't true anyway, but the <laughs> stories he had. So he was a great entertainer. I mean, I learned so much about his family and his friends and so on. And whenever times were really, really difficult, he was always the first stop, shut out the window, shut out the door to get the, get the crack going. Because sometimes, you know, again, bad wing shifts, you'd be down. And he would motivate people right away. I mean, I, I've said about the worst, the worst wing shift ever was between uh, the hunger strikes whenever we smashed the place up and the RAS squad come in and got Indians and they kept us in cells all night um, with no blankets or mattress or anything and moved us the next day again, beat us up again, run the gauntlet the next day. And I'm telling you, it was definitely the worst wing shift ever. And I remember they just throwing me in the cell and hit six. You just lay in the corner feeling sorry for yourself. And I, the whole wing was quiet. And probably everybody was the exact same because we had taken so much. Then Joe McDonald's up at the window. <laughs> There's going to be bad days for these good ones. That was him right away, you know, and it just lifted the whole place. And that was him, you know. Um, brilliant for that. So, um, and of course, he never showed up about his family. You know, sometimes he went on too much, and I explained about the winter of 78, and I've explained in the book, I mean, I can remember times where you're huddled beside the pipes with the blankets wrapped around you, and, you know, there's a gale force wind, and there's probably snow coming through the window, and he's got a chak rock from Greta, somebody smuggled in for him, and he's got news, and he has, to, he has to tell you the news, and it's about his children, and he's shouting at me, to get up the window, get up the window, well, I've got a chak rock, come on up the window. I said, God, get up the window, it's freezing, right? And he keeps going and going, and I'm, I'm not for getting up, and then McConvo and myself, and he said, for Christ's sake, get up, you know what he's like, get up and talk to him, because he's not for stopping. So I get up, mother and all sorts of F's under my breath, and he's telling me about his children, about school, and about his, his mother's knitting the iron sweaters, and the uh, Bernadette's getting sk roller skates for Christmas, and so on, you're starting to <laughs> freeze me. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, right, oh, mother's allowed it, yes, okay, yes, yes, right. And then you, know, you, you pass yourself for about 10 minutes and, 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 and then you get down and say, that's right. You, know, you feel good for yourself then. You know, what, you know, what passion he showed for his children. And he always talked about the day the brown bags would come in. Brown bags was a, a metaphor for political status because they took the clothes off us and put, there was no black bags in the day, it was brown paper bags. And they put all your clothes in the brown bags. So once the brown bags come in the wing, you were getting your clothes again, therefore you were getting political status. She always talked about the, the brown bags would come into the wing and we'll get our clothes and we'll go out on a visit and he would go out victorious to that visit and see his wife and his children wearing his own clothes, you know. And he, he always believed that was going to happen. Never doubted it for a while. At least that's what he told us. Maybe sometimes he said these things just to keep our morale up. But he, he, never, he never shut up about the brown bags, and he was even organising for, you know, what we were going to do when we get political stars, about, you know, the clicks, you're going to be doing this, and you're going to be doing that, and we're going to, you know, it all organised right down to your tea. So, as I said, a great character, and, and, you know, he wouldn't take visits, he refused to take visits because he wouldn't wear the gear, and, I mean, that wasn't very difficult, given that, you know, we had a family as well. But I also say he knew more about the outside world than any of the rest of us who were taking visits because he had a whole clique of guys smuggling chapter rocks in and out for him and Greta were on the country for him as well, furthest to Greta. Um, between, particularly Raymond McCartney was on appeal visits at that time. That meant he had three uh, visits a week, three 15-minute visits, and Greta had come up and seen him all, Raymond all the time. Therefore, um, Joe was getting regular, regular communication. But... Um, as I said, it's just, it was a giant of a figure and, you know, he kept a lot of us, you know, our morale up and he stood up for us in times, you know, when things were difficult with screws and stood up the screws and so on. So, he, as I said, he kept morale up, he protected you and, you know, you, you, you feel a wee bit guilty when he's gone, you know, like he, as, as all of us, you know, I mean, they died for us, 
that died for us. Yes, obviously the bigger picture. It wasn't just political status. And we've already said about what's lost and jails lost for the struggle and be criminalised and so on. But the big motiva motivating factor was um, the died for us. Because as you know, we always sent down, tell the lads and not let them down, tell the lads and not let them down. And you referred to it as well whenever Joe's on what, 60 days in hunger strike or something, and the William and the her. And right away, usually with Joe, make sure the lads have all got cigarettes. So always thinking of everybody else, organising all the time. And that was him, right, right to the very end, right to the very end, you know. So, um, as I said, yeah, you know, obviously, whenever I was leaving, I think when you're still the hitch blocks, I think almost in a way you still feel a wee bit of closeness to the lads, because you're there and that's where they were. And I think that, that night when I was leaving, you felt you're sort of leaving them behind, you know. And you, I remember saying to myself, I don't want to forget them, you know. I mean, the building keeps them alive, you know, because you imagine these when you sell up, and that keeps it alive. We said, God, if I go, you know, I'll, I'll forget about them. But I haven't forgot about them. Obviously, at, you know, at the roads. And some of the good things are, and it was just, just the way it worked out. Um, I mean, I still remember St. Teresa's, I played for St. Teresa's, one of, one of my best players, by the way. Joe right? <laughs> 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 so played for St. Teresa's. Oh, right? So did Kieran. Kieran played for St. Teresa's as well, so it was talked about that. And also the school I teach in, Joe went to that school. Oh. You know, it's a, it's a street where he lived, he lived in Slade Street, and that's where the school is, it's in Joseph Slade Street. So he, so his name's on the roll, his brothers and sisters' names are on the roll too. And also, on the gable wall in our backyard where the mobiles and so on, there's a placket show. So it's every day when I go around the school, checking classes and so on, he's just he's looking down. So he's there all the time, looking down on me, you know, probably saying you're a waster, you should have done this, that and the other, you know. <laughs> Was that that's the type of person he was, you know. There was a lot of black dark humour in the deal, you know, and it said sometimes irreverent, but that was Joe. You know, that was good. So, no, um, uh, as I said, a giant of a figure, mm -hmm. really was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I owe him a lot. Particular person, I owe him an awful lot. And the lads all owe him a lot too, just like all the other lads. We owe them so much, yeah, you know. Do, yeah. Thank you. So, Lawrence, your last memories um, of Joe and the other, the other fellows would have been in the hospital. Um, it has a particular poignancy. I'm sure that place for you, and I know, I mean, when we were pushed you, like, you, you, you had visited it a number of times, and I know you brought Quail and Orla up, and you did, you know, you wanted to do something special to, to have them recorded there, laughing and all of that. So, what would your abiding memories be of the hospital? Uh, well, well, there's, there's a pile. <coughs> um, I know later, if we are going to do one reading, I'll... We'll cover that up as the time Jerry came in this is. But um well no, in the first one in the first I'd seen Joe from that would have been Ramond or really early on. I'm not even sure really in seen much there or we but in H five, but but it was that whole time of the Irish Commission for Justice and Peace come in. I'd only um started the hunger strike a week earlier. I was in H three, Big Swing. Um we'll see Tom McAuby and was in. Um or had been in before he moved up to the hospital. So we, we were taking up me and Red Mick, who was in age five at the time, for the meeting. And that's when um, when I seen Joe there, because they were there to meet the Irish Commission for Justin Peace. Nobody sort of had a clue what, what it was about and all the rest of it. But um, me and Mick arrived earlier. We were waiting for a bit of an hour in the canteen until the lads were let out at two o'clock. Um, the thing about the hospital, <laughs> same as, Giles referred at that time with the, the two wings come off. And if you're in the hospital, you weren't tactically a protesting prisoner. Now, you're in the hospital because you're on hunger strike, but you're technically not a protesting prisoner because um, <clears throat> you're in the hospital, so therefore you're, you're not fit to work. So you're not breaking any rules, not fit to work. And in the hospital, you wear pajamas, you don't wear a prison uniform, so you can't be charged either. So now you can get cigarettes and get, <laughs> get books and get a radio and all the rest. It was a bit of, a bit of an irony, you know, you're, you're down, but you're not a protesting. You know? yeah. mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the, the lads are out at two o'clock and come up to uh, what would have been a uh, recreation time for it. And uh, everybody was there apart from, apart from Joe. And I've said that already, but I, like, if I hadn't known it was Joe, then I wouldn't have recognised the, the figure that came in in a wheelchair. Because um, he was just, a, I mean, Joe was called Fat Joe, like ironically, but on the way, maybe during the, the, the whole protest where everybody else was losing it. 
Um, and this was just like a shell. Uh, and because you wore like dressing gowns and all the rest of it, you sort of accentuate it just how sunken the face is and all the rest of it. And it's pretty lesson to me because it, uh, cause his head was lying over the side and sort of like some dribbles coming out of his mouth and all the rest of it. And there is a thing where sometimes you see someone, say it was a lesson to me, you see someone who's disabled, physically disabled, and somehow you think they're maybe mentally disabled, and then they start to speak and you realize, God, no, they're maybe geniuses, you know. Uh, and that's what I thought I'd seen Joe, I think it's like, just like this shell of a person. And, uh, but then when he, when he spoke, and it was, you know, back and I was, everybody get cigarettes there and water, and like I said, the spring water and all the rest of it, it was like a novelty, I think. And, uh, and do you know any crack of these ones here, Beck? And Beck says, no, just you know, they represent the Dublin government and the Catholic Church and, and whatever, but we'll see what they have. And he says, hey, he wasn't going to be able to stay there for it. Uh, and there was Big Doc or, or Kevin Lynch. And um, he says, well, look, I'll, I'll hang, on, hang in there as long as I can. Uh, don't be accepting the name for, for me. It's a five to monitor. Or nothing, and, uh, and he gripped back again and said, it's, it's, it's a fire to monitor nothing back. And, uh, and then they took him back out again. And uh, that made me on for a couple of days, then came to nothing, they ended up in a whole sort of, you know, row between the ICJP and the NIO, and you know, they said they were promising one thing, and the NIO was saying they never promised anything. Back to that thing again about, you know, what's on offer, what's a deal, what's, what's not a deal, they were trying to tell us <coughs> that they had it's six demands for us, actually. And uh, I remember I said, Jamon Q. Logue, who's the SDLP guy, who's sitting across from me, a really interesting thing. First day, come in and carry these wee miniature cigarettes, or cigars. So we were going, girl, we'll have, have, we'll have some of them. them. <laughs> Pass them in. So the, the, the box of ten went quickly. It didn't bring them in the next day. You know? <laughs> but um, he ended up saying that we have the pieces. He kept telling me the pieces of, of the demands, the six demands. The sixth one, and, uh, and I said, oh, what's the sixth one? It says recognition of the Irish language, and as a, as a token of it, you get um, presented with Bible in Irish. He says, should I put on the clothes now and go up to the other blocks and get to do <laughs> Irish classes and get a Bible in Irish? But that was, that was the level of it, and to his credit, um, Joe, um, Oliver Crowley, father Oliver Crowley, was on the, the delegation, and the first day he did most of the talk, and the second day wasn't a cheap bit for me, it obviously had been nullered by his own. Delegation. This, I think, really stands out to me. He was a, a cousin of Tom McElwee and Francie Hughes. And by whatever time on Sunday, this was not for her, and they got ex exhausted. And, um, and someone would say, Big, Big Doc and, and, and Kevin couldn't, couldn't be at it. And Tom McElwee, if any, Oliver Crowley was, was facing it. And Tom says, and looks up and says, So basically, you're saying we have the clothes and nothing else. And his credit, Oliver Crowley says, Yeah. Hugh Logue, he sat across from me, leaps out of his seat, and what I ever thought was really amazing what he did, it would be criminally irresponsible to say that. And I thought the fact that he used the word criminally mm -hmm. in that context was just unbelievable. He's talking to one of his delegation, and that was it, that was the end of the meeting. So, I mean, that time was very, um, stands out. I mean, our time was never Jerry Eichmann, which you can, can read about it. Or, um, I mean, there's all thoughts of our times when. You know, when Paddy Quinn took like we were out in the yard and uh, there was this screw there. He wasn't the worst, but a silly guy, Green, he's a tall English man, former Brit. Um, and Paddy, <coughs> Paddy Quinn was, 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 was taking all of this. It was the whole, same as that happened, Martin Horson starting to hallucinate and conky water down and all the rest of it. But he was making this real sound, like, a, like, a, like an animal, like a cow or something, you know, that's in distress. And I remember him on Green saying, what's Richard Green you call him? He said, what, what's that? And I says, Paddy Quinn. And um, it, was, it, was, it was really unnerving. And I was sitting Pat, Pat Bjog was there, Pat McEwen was there as well. And I'm Matt Devlin. And um, I never grew up in this really raise up. And then it was like, and it's funny because Paddy and I shared it sell with Paddy for probably the got two years. We always joked about being a. Um, Native American, Indian, because he had this real sort of swarthy, they had jet black hair. And, um, but he started to make this sound like you would see like an old, old Western um, Indians dancing around doing the war dance. It's a high pitched sort of thing to do. Well, that's what actually Paddy was nearly doing, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then the next minute you just see this sob, like I mean, like an awful 
just you know, just a solvent, and uh, I'll be able to come in from the yard. I'd have known for about an hour, and then I heard his mother coming, and uh, and saying, "You okay, Paddy? You all right? You all right, son?" And um, I remember thinking to myself, I just I just just do something for him, uh, because again, he was going into this. So that sound just went, and then like, like it's a sob rather than a cry. You know, it's, like, it's almost like human sounds, and uh, and then it all went quiet. And um, I suppose I'd, I'd figured out what had what had happened. Um, and you just had a lot of, a lot of that. You know, it was um, I think of just you no know, witness as people, yeah. people died, and you just get weaker and weaker in yourself. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I did notice was. Um, I know it was particularly with Tom Michael Wee, that anybody who wanted a certain length like that for a length of time ended up having a, a bell movement. And often thought it was like, almost like the reverse, just to hear of people getting hung and their bells open. It was almost like the reverse of this, that you know, the bell opened and then you're going to be dead. But really, after it happened, people died within two or three days after it. And, and, and they're just, their, their energy, whatever energy they had in them, because it was always this thing about getting up. Even to sit in the bed, get out of the bed, get onto the chair. And one of the orderlies would have helped us, like Bobby Higgins, great, great guy for, for all of this. I mean, you I was blind and all the rest, but you still get out, just psychologically, just to keep going, because everybody who died wanted to live right up until the last moment that they, they did die. And, um, and I had lots of training, I thought that I was going to say, oh yes, but so that happened to Tom. And then, uh, and then he died a few days later. And I was talking to Tom. And the morning walked up. He, <laughs> like Tom, always liked the, the cigarettes. And uh, walked up past him. He sat up in bed, smoking. And uh, we got out to the yard. And um, by the time I came back in again, he was he was dead. Father Toner had been in with him, left to go up to see somebody at the top of the wing, and back down again. He was, he was dead. Um, but when it happened to Red Mick, then you knew that was like a, a, a sign. And then when it happened to myself. Um, I mean, you end up knowing, and I think it's, I can tell you, it's an agonizing thing. It lasts for a couple of hours, like it's the first time in 65, 66, 67 days that you've had a bell mm -hmm. movement. It just, it's, it's just like it rips your body apart. But what, what it seemed to be is then it just was a signal of this is the end. This is the end. And I couldn't mm -hmm. even, even go to the bed and that. So it was, I mean, it becomes a bit of a world on its own. And I was like, families coming in and you, you hear them, and one sense you try to, Stay away from them. They give them their own sort of yeah. space mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. Um, and other times, and 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 joking times, you know. I mean, I'll, I'll read that wee bit where it shows the the, the crack then as well, you know. But okay. um, and it's interesting how they even have been boring. We're we're allowed to smoke, but um, and I remember Paul Lennon, who was a screw, but he was a medical. Um, Officer, he was a Catholic, but he was also a trained nurse. Whereas a lot of the rest of them weren't. They did six weeks first aid training. Um, I mean, we were short of fags, he would give us 20 bucks of fags, so we would pay him back on it. But there was one guy there, uh, Carswell, I don't know if anybody remembers him, as a, and like he stole the fags. And we, we, we called him on what I name him, I name him as <laughs> the guy who stole it. But just the thought, like, to have, to do something as petty as that, yeah. when they're er earning a fortune. And the only thing that people who are in this place are, you know, are, are, are down. And, and he had done it on Bobby. Whenever Bobby was at the start, Bobby Sands, they weren't allowed at that stage to, to smoke and all. It's only as, as hunger strike went on, they started to sort of regulate the thing, I suppose. Um, so Bobby had the, the snout rolled up and, and hidden. Uh, he might have had it in the, was the, the skirting board in one of the places where there's no skirting board on there, but he also had it in the bed. Anyway. Carswell was always determined he was going to get Bobby's snout. And, um, and even one day they did find it. Um, in a pillow or something. And they came out and he said, yeah, I've got Sansa's snout and cheering about it. And that orderly, Bobby Higgins, who's a Protestant guy, who ironically had worked with Bobby Sands one time for a couple of weeks in the uh, coach, coach building thing or something. Um, and he ended up in jail. I think it was like tax, tax evasion. I think he took a rap for his for his son-in-law or something, you know, but he was brilliant to us, but what happened that day when he came out and Carswell came out screaming, and the, like an orderly's job is a real cushy number in the, in the, 
in the hospital, they got steaks sent up on a Thursday night and I could smell of them. <laughs> and they're always totally embarrassed with us. But I'm like, um, Carswell comes out, yeah, I got Santos, right, and all the rest of it. And Bobby Higgins walked up and says, you proud of that? Mm. He says, well, I give him a tuck shop a day. I'd be buying him a uh, half ounce of snout and give him the, the Bobby. Now, he could just been immediately thrown off the hospital, thrown out of the orderly thing, all the rest of it. I think the horse screws were so embarrassed at what had happened that they just uh, let, it uh, pass. Let, let, let it pass. So, you have to, I mean, it's an interesting thing to observe human nature. Like, I remember after a big dog died, um, this screw also, um, I can't remember his name now, he's a really, really good looking guy. He was there for years afterwards, very quiet, born again Christian, and uh, he used to dim the big dog all the time. And uh, he came in to me a few days after Doc had died, and he says, um, he says, I, I believe myself. He was, he was dead sound, never cheap out of him, really pleasant guy. Um, he says, I believe, Lawrence, I have a strong faith, but there's nothing as strong as tears. He said, I have conversations with him about religion and all the rest of it, and he says, he was just totally sure what he was doing was totally right. And he says, I, I don't have that faith. Yeah. And so it's interesting how. If, um, I think someone just took us real distance, or you have cars well who's trying to mess about. Others adopted this almost sort of totally clinical, objective thing, way you take our blood pressure and really that's it. And then others who maybe did sort of um, affect them in a sense, you know, yeah. they realize yeah. there's people down here. You know, it's just interesting to see how nearly subhuman some people can be. Well, it's, yeah, it's under no situations. I mean, I read the horror cases mm -hmm. where. You know, screws who did things like big hack ramps, he'd put on the record player one night or putting the cigarettes on the bobby and he'd six, you know, like and you go like why why did they do it the thing? And yeah. maybe it was a bit of humanity or something, you sure, know. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Um, one. Okay, so I'm thinking maybe it'd be a good time if you want to maybe read an excerpt sure, from each of your books because it's kind of you know time's yeah. been on I'd Wayne sitting there and everybody's <laughs> hanging up there. <laughs> 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 well, could I invite you first? Right, I don't know what they're doing. They listen to about 40 pages here. Just keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> An extra. <laughs> um, <laughs> goodness. I'm going to write something about Joe McDonald and read about the early days and the protest. Um, let me about who? The escape? Is it right. big bit about the escape? Yeah. <laughs> Don't you never ask? I'm going to ask you to talk about it, but that might be better. Ah, uh, because he stole the show, you know. <laughs> 100 words, Jess. <laughs> yeah, well, and I'll just I'll read quickly part of the prologue because I don't want to go on and on. Yeah. All right? And, I mean, that was the second biggest day. Really? Obviously, the biggest day was, was Bobby was elected, but that was something else when somebody came into my cell and said, um, would you like to go on, a, on a, an escape? Would you like to go on an escape? Open <laughs> 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 hell. <laughs> What's not the like? So, um, okay, very quickly, part of it, right? And then I'll, I'll look at, see your faces and the head start to drop, will stop. <laughs> so, um, this is not part of the plan. I've been emphatically told your, foot, your feet won't even touch the ground. So, say, you're on. Along with my IRA comrades, I would be transported to freedom. It was good. Uh, it was good to be true. Too, sorry, it was too good to be true. And as life had taught me, <coughs> things don't always go the way uh, they're planned. My comrades didn't want to discuss contingency plans. There was to be no talk of a plan B. Plan A was going to work. Shin A. I think we're supposed to the, the goods wagon, the food wagon, supposed to bring us the whole way across the border. All right, there's probably no South Armagh. Well, it's going to be an armed convoy. Didn't work. Okay, plan A didn't work. So anyway, plan A did go well. We had secured H7, taken over the entire block, arrested the prison officers and stripped them of their uniforms, which some was now wore. We breached the security at the various phases as we sent in the exit long cash. 37 of us hidden in the back of the lorry, uh, in, the, in the well of the passenger seat in the front, hidden lay Jerry Kelly, pointing a gun at the screw driving the lorry. But at the final gate, the prison, of the prison, sorry, the tally lodge, the escape had come to an abrupt end. The prison's inside a camp, it's inside an army camp, so the prison was inside that. So, the last gate of the prison. There it was standing before the perimeter wall with a huge metal gate inching open, clueless because I had no plan B. I had no idea what lay on the other side, exposed, vulnerable, and almost shit myself, worrying 
that it was well in the sights of the soldier and his rifle perched above in the watchtower. Seconds were passing and decisions had to be made, decisions which I knew would be life changing. The gate opened only to reveal a Scrooge car blocking our path. I was like a rabbit caught in the headlights with no idea of my next move. Scores of my comrades came spilling out from the back of the hijack lorry, our supposed transport to freedom. Bobby Story, leader of the escape, shouted for us to head out the gate, in other words, to improvise. I raced out the gate, alert, alive, adrenaline racing through my limbs. Yes, I had made it beyond the perimeter wall, but danger had increased because as an escape prisoner, I was now liable to be shot. I was immediately confronted with a line of screws, buttons in hand, and equally pumped up. Two of my comrades, outnumbered, were standing before them. But fear, instinct, I don't know what it was, propelled me to charge through. A dozen comrades were coming behind me. We beat a passage and emerged at the other end. A red car appeared with a screw behind the wheel, but before his eyes, a bewildering scene of bedlam. I belted towards the car and grabbed the door handle of the passenger side, but it wouldn't open. The driver accelerated, pulling me along. <laughs> I desperately held on until the last second before the car sped off in the distance. <coughs> There was screaming and shouting, total chaos, total confusion. Comrades, some in prison uniforms, being pursued by prisoners who were running across the fields, covered in rolls of barbed wire that stretched out for about 200 yards from the perimeter wall. I didn't fancy their chances because they could be easily picked off by the Brits in the watchtowers. As if reading my thoughts, the screws were roaring to the soldiers above, shoot them, shoot them. I noticed that another screw's cars had been commandeered and I made a beeline for it. I pushed my way through the screws and dived through the driver's door past Meter, who was behind the steering wheel. And with relief, I got seated beside him. Three more comrades had jumped in the back, but then a screw suddenly reached in and pulled the keys from the ignition. Meter immediately jumped out, punched him, took back the keys and got back in. Harry Murray appeared and was banging at my window with imploring eyes, but I couldn't, I couldn't get the fucking door open. <laughs> And the screws were swarming around the car. How he took off towards the fields, um, which you know he's later shot. The screws uh, were like a bunch of wild animals. They were frothing at the mouse, screaming, lashing at the windows with their battens. Mila was cursing and struggling to get the car to start. Then one of the screws pointed a gun at us. When he attempted to fire, the gun jammed. The windscreen caved in and onto the blows, uh, and we were shard with glass. But at, the very, at that very incident, thank God, the car kicked into life. The screw flung the gun at Meter's head, but missed. So we were off, and we, were now, we now had to drive a half mile round the perimeter wall, which was still inside the British Army security zone, in order to get the final bar barrier, which was the gate to freedom. I looked up at the towers and was shaking as we approached and passed them. My heart was racing close to panic as I felt sure we were going to be shot. I shrunk into the seat to make myself as small as possible. Then I remembered the screw's gun and began frantically searching for it. Where the hell is that gun? No shots came and it dawned on me that the Brit um, above in the, the tally lodge must have really were ahead and an ambush was being prepared. No sooner had this thought uh, occurred when I noticed a red car, the one that I had tried to seize racing behind us. I told Meter to put the boot down, but he told me to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> he was, it was a bit tense. He was, <laughs> he, a bit he was driving, he was driving at normal speed in the hope that the bitch would assume we were prison officers. We turned the final bend and there before us at the camp gate, the British security sensory alerted to our appearance, dived to shut it. Meter put the pedal, I uh, sorry, the pedal to the floor at last, right? And as we roared full speed towards freedom, I was sure this was going to be the end of the world with us mangled against the gate and probably riddled uh, to death. So there you go. <laughs> um, Mater said I, I took a long time looking for the gun. Um, you know, we're sitting there down like this here, and he says, what I was actually doing was hiding so as the screws and the towers wouldn't know I was there, and he was going to be the only target. I was going to shoot the one shoot him, and I was going to be all right. But that's all a lie, obviously. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, Lawrence, from yourself. I mean, the thing about the, about the, the, the escape is the fact that um, 
It was <coughs> less than two years from the end of the Donker Street, yeah. which is actually amazing, but I think the more I hang about it, um, you know, prison escapes, probably up until then, was a few people trying to go climb over a wall or dig a tunnel or, right. or, or whatever. Like the sheer audacity to think, you know, which was like the lorry and not their come up with the idea. Yeah. To think you like to do it like the, like where we all seen walls, Larry seen gates, and if there's a gate, there's a person, if there's a person, there's a weakness. Yeah, like the Russian dolls and someone said yeah, in the yeah. area. And just, uh, and, and to me, I think that's the most phenomenal thing about it is that <clears throat> thinking big and have the audacity to think way, way outside the box, you know. Yeah. I think even Larry knew what a box was. You know? Yeah. I have to say, too, that's the day Bobby's story really stood up. I always remember mm -hmm. for that. I knew Bobby from way, way back, 1972. And you know, like a prophet in your own land, not, not a prophet, you don't regard someone as a prophet. So, I mean, it was no big shakes to me. But I can tell you, that day of the escape, I'll never forget how he stood up, you know, led the whole thing, took responsibility, and particularly when we were caught, because I was lucky. The governor actually escorted me down, made sure I got only a slight beating. They kicked the shit clean out of them. No way. And there's two of the guys were kicked unconscious. And... Uh, I just wanted them to stay away. See, when the door was closed, happy days, leave me alone. I don't, want, I don't care about water blankets or anything, just leave me alone. And then when Bobby came in, he's up at the doors, organising right away. Get on them bells, get the screws down. We want blankets, we want this, we want that. I said, Bobby, no way, <laughs> keep them away. And he was our number one target. Mm -hmm. He was our number one target. And now he is right away barking at them, get them to do this, do that, do the other. Fantastic. Yeah, no, and he was. And that's, that's when he stood up. <coughs> Okay, I'll not read all of this. It's a bit of a. It's about the time Jerry Adams was led into hospital to, to see us. Uh, one afternoon, the assistant governor came to tell us that Jerry Adams, Owen Caron, and Seamus Roddy would be coming to visit us in about an hour's time. This was something totally out of the blue. I'd been lying on the bed, but now I got up to pace the floor, an old habit of mine formed during the blanket protest. Five paces forward, five paces back. I took the visit to be a very positive sign. If Jerry Adams and Owen Caron were coming in, it must mean some approach had been made to them by the Brits. Jerry, as with Danny Morrison, was banned from visiting the prison. At the same time, I didn't want to get too optimistic. I had experienced the fiasco of the Irish Commission for Justice and Peace intervention. I knew the Brits would do anything. Nevertheless, I couldn't stop my spirits from soaring and imagining the possibility that there had been some significant breakthrough. Besides that, I was excited about meeting Jerry Adams. I'd heard much talk about him from others who knew him from his time in the cages. We were unlocked shortly before the usual time and made our way to the canteen, <coughs> all except Big Dog and Kieran Lynch. At this stage, Kevin Lynch was critically ill. Big Dog was conscious, but too weak to be moved out of bed. Those of us who did meet with Jerry Owen and Seamus, Pat Bug, Ewan, Big Tom, Paddy, Paddy Quinn, Red Mick, Matt Devlin and myself, were in good form, curious about what was happening and speculating on what could be behind it all. The fact that Seamus Ruddy, an IRSP spokesperson, was also coming with Jerry Adams and Owen Curran, added to the speculation that a possible deal had been worked out with all parties involved. We didn't have too long to wait before they arrived in the hospital canteen. Beck was also present by now, arriving at around the same time. Everyone was introduced, though Beck, though Beck and Pat were already known to Adams from their time spent together in the cages. The rest of us soon became acquainted. It was explained to them that the other two lads were too weak to attend. They said they would look in on them once they had talked to us. The meeting came together fairly quickly. We gathered around a few tables and Jerry began by explaining events leading up to his visit and hence the reason for it. He outlined how Father Fall had called the families together to talk about their relatives on hunger strike and had claimed that the hunger strikers were unaware of the true situation that he did not have knowledge about <coughs> feelings or offence on the outside and that Jerry Adams should personally visit the hunger strikers and make this known to them. Fall had said that he would see to it that Jerry be granted permission from the NIO to visit the jail. All of this was, of course, to put Jerry Adams and the leadership of the Republican movement under moral pressure. Jerry told us that when asked, he readily agreed to visit us and give us an appraisal of the situation and how he saw our position in relation to the possibility of the Brits conceding our demands. It was a grim picture. There were no ifs or buts. He said there were no deals on the table, under the table or anywhere else. Really, he was spelling out for us what we, in a sense, knew, but didn't like to think about. The Brits had already allowed six men to die, and they would most likely allow more to die. Certainly, there was no movement to indicate that they desired a speedy resolution to the protest. 
All three of them pointed out the great admiration the ISIS community felt for us and that nothing but respect would be shown to us if we decided to end the fast there and then. We said we didn't want to. We believed then as firmly as when we first joined it that our demands were just and should be granted. We had also lost too many comrades to stop now. Jerry again stressed that if he continued, then most likely all around the table would be dead in a matter of weeks. Once these serious points have been covered, we engage in some light banter, a sort of gallows humour. Big Tom, Tom McAwee, wanted to know why the IRA couldn't hit Charlie's wedding. This is Prince Charles. <laughs> this is Big Tom. About £500 of blowy gear under the reception table and a few other remarks along the same lines. There was, la there was laughter among the stalkery, the poker strikers, but I'm not so sure if the other three felt quite as comfortable sitting in company which was, in a light-hearted, though no less serious way, debating the merits of wiping out the entire English royal family. It made us feel good anyway. So it was time for them to leave. Jerry had told each of us about his meeting with our families and how they were keeping. They then said that they would go to see the other lads, the other two lads, shook hands with us and left the canteen. They went in and Kevin Lynch's cell first. There was nothing to be said or done there. Uh, Kevin was in a, in a sort of coma at that time. Though Jerry spoke with Kevin's family. They then went to see Big Duck, who was still lucid and who could speak. Jerry explained the reason for their visit, just as he had done with us, and told Kieran that if he continued on hunger strike, he would be dead within a few days. Doc said he was very aware of that, but if our demands were not granted, then that is what would happen. He knew that he was what he was doing and what he believed in. On the way out of the cell, Doc's parents met and spoke with Jerry, Bick and the others. They asked what the situation was, and Jerry told them what he had told us and Kieran. They just listened to this and nodded, more or less was saying to the fact that they would be watching their son die any day soon. On their way back up the wing, Jerry, Owen and Seamus called into the canteen with us again. Owen was very visibly crying and no doubt all three had been deeply moved by the experience, though it wasn't the time or place to sit and philosophise about it. We shook hands again and they departed. I don't think there was much conversation between those of us left in the canteen. Gradually we drifted back to ourselves. Our earlier high spirits had dropped sharply. Each of us understood the cold reality of the picture that they had just painted. The Brits were intent on crushing us. There would be no humanitarian gestures, and appeals for goodwill would fall on deaf ears. We were on our own. Jenny. Okay, go on my own, Lawrence. Um, I'm just conscious of time, um, and I'm just thinking maybe if there's a lot the other question or two, maybe, that somebody wants to ask, um, we, can take, we can take one or two questions, but we don't want to probably go on too long. Yeah. Did you ever find that gun, though? <laughs> <laughs> I got five years for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'm just going to ask Jazz and Lorne, have you got any closing remarks you'd like to me leave us with if, if you feel there's something else that you would like to say before we close the evening. Or maybe it's all been said. I think it's um I mean I think it's important that all that all that the, the, the accounts are are written about that period and because they're all different experiences and all the rest. I think the thing about that <laughs> five years um I mean, I talked about the, the period of time between 1980 and 81, the hunger strikes have been the worst period. At the end of, of, of 81, the, uh, of the hunger strike, it was called off on the 3rd of October. Um, we didn't really know where we were, where we were going. Um, we were determined we were going to get the, the outstanding demands. I think that was the, the critical thing. But in a sense, that whole form of prison protest was ended for good. Um, there was never again going to be a protest like the blanket protest, no wash, hunger strikes. That physical force, yeah, bring it on, we'll take it, you know, we'll, 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 you know, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Uh, it was now, you know, that, that, that's not happening, so where do we go? And there's an awful lot of soul searching to see where, where we can, and, and, tra and traumatic sort of, of things. And, um, but it was, I got a little sound about no one done enough, well, you aren't, click. Person isn't strong, has to be clever. And I think really at that point, that's when we became clever in the, in the, the escape. 
less than two years later, seen it, that I don't think we understood the strength that we had uh, in a group of people who were totally disciplined, totally committed to one another as well as the objectives, um, same political ideology generally. So when you, when you look back on it, the prison system was never going to withstand what, what we did to it afterwards. But if you had asked me on the 4th of, of October 1981, like, where were we? Um, like I remember the, the prison governor, the last, I think the prison governor years later, when everything sort of paid with the man and everything was relaxed and all the rest of it, and he was a um, security governor. And they were down the wings at times, and he was talking to me, and he was saying, uh, it was all first names. He said, Lawrence, the only thing was, like, nobody ever thought, he meant from the administration side, what they do once you come out from behind the doors. And I, I could have said to them, fuck, we didn't know what we were going to do, we won't come out from behind the doors. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I didn't, of course, I said, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But in a sense, it was, uh, there was a lot of learning from that time. But, and, and everything that came was built on, on what had happened there. But it was that, it, it took all that period of time and, and we had to go through all of that horror stuff to get to that point where then it was, right, there's nothing going to stop us now because we'll, we'll do anything, bar nothing. To get get out of so Yeah, that was a big lesson. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I'm very proud of that period. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that comes across, and I suppose that was another motivating factor in writing about it. Um, and even more so, whenever I got out and reflected over that whole period, just, I mean, even the sophistication of the organisation of the IRA in the jail. Um, there's things that I would have liked to have wrote about as well, and I know other people like Kelly and so on would have liked to wrote about them. Um, I talked to Bobby about it. I say this now, now Bobby's no longer with us, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't. He says, no, we can't do that because of this, that, and the other. But I would still like some, a lot of things to come out, what went on inside the jail and how close some things came and you know some of the things that we did and how we were so well organised and how we were getting intelligence and so on. It was very sophisticated and I'm very, very proud to be part of that. I was also obviously very, very proud to have known I spent time with great men as well. That will always be with me. And then it's also, um, I think it steals you for what happens outside and that the struggle didn't end with jail. The struggle still going on and just like jail, there were setbacks, there were times of demoralised, but then there were good times, you know, whenever, yes, you're winning. And, you know, the way I see it is, we're going to continue to do what we did in jail. We're going to keep travelling. We're never going to arrive, because we're going to keep want to improve society. And along that route, there's going to be pitfalls and so on. But just like jail, just keep going, keep going, keep going. And I think that's, that was my lesson in life from my time in jail, that you'll get there in the end. As long as you're motivated, as long as you're committed, you're going to get there in the end. It might take time, obviously, but you're going to get there. Okay? Thank you. Okay, can I just finish now by saying thank you for me to my old uh, jazz and the Lorne, and just to say that those, these two books, I think, are...